Good morning and welcome everyone to the Student Leadership Conference. We are all very excited to see all the hard work of speakers, the Office of Student Life and the Black Male Initiative Program have done to make this conference come together. And if you have any questions, you can use the chat below to the bottom of your screen. And um, I will now pass it over to Zeri, who's going to introduce our interim dean, Mr. Jorge Silva Puras. Thank you, Shamarie. Hi, everyone. Hi. My, my name is Zari Ernst. I'm the public editor for the SPS Student Association. I'm also a graduate student in the Research Administration and Compliance Program. We're so thrilled to be having the conference, and thank you so much for joining. It's my pleasure to announce our interim dean, Jorge Silva Perez. Previously, Dean Silva Perez was the provost at Universidad del Sagrado Corazon in San Juan, Puerto Rico, where he led its transformation to remote teaching institution. For the last eight years, he also taught business and entrepreneurship at Hostess Community College, Sagrado, and NYU. Prior to his work in academia, he served as President Obama's appointee as SBA Administrator for Region 2 in New York City, leading SBA's programs in New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands. Dean Silva Perez holds a Bachelor of Arts from Yale University, a JD from the University of Puerto Rico, and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin and the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. So I will now let Dean Silva Perez take it away. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Thierry. And uh, it's a pleasure to be to be here. Uh, and I'm honored to welcome you all to the session today. I'm all, also delighted to welcome Dr. Jonathan Quaj as the keynote speaker for this 2022 Student Leadership Conference. Uh, as you may know, Dr. Quaj is the interim university director for the CUNY-wide Black Male Initiative uh, he previously served as the York College Male Initiative Program and Special Programs Director from 2004 through last year, 2021. Uh, Dr. Quash has thought to expand opportunities for students of underrepresented populations by creating original programming and constantly striving to find new ways to achieve student success. His leadership and experience is felt CUNY-wide and I know we will provide participants, he will provide participants with thought provoking content. So I really want to thank you for uh, giving us the honor of joining us today. I also want to congratulate the students and staff that have made the 2022 Student Leadership Conference possible and successful. I have participated in, in several events this week and I uh, must say really, really delighted and uh, so impressed and so proud uh, of our students, uh, of your dedication and uh, of your leadership. Um, and you, you're so well, so well, ex express yourself so well and, and, and lead so well that it's really an honor, a privilege uh, to be your interim dean. So with that again, Dr. Quash, uh, glad to have you uh, and, and welcome to SPS in this virtual environment. And, and all the best uh, during the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Peraz. And um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Quash. He is the interim university director for the CUNY Black Male Initiative. Dr. Quash previously served as the York College Male Initiative Program and Special Programs Director from 2004 to 2021. Dr. Quash has sought to expand opportunities for students of underrepresented, sorry, upper underrepresented populations by creating original programming and constantly striving to find new ways to achieve student success. So I now pass it to Dr. Jonathan Quash. Uh, thank you so very much. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Shauna Marie and also Dean Roy, thank you for that introduction as well. I do appreciate this. And I just want to thank uh, those of you who not only who have gathered here for today's session, uh, but the, the uh, BMI program uh, at School of Professional Studies, Anthony Sweeney and the incredible Michael Gilbert. Um, so we thank you so much for um, all the hard work you're doing. We're, we're, we're really excited that SPS is part of the BMI family now. 
Um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on BMI, because I, I, uh, I know it may not be something familiar to everyone. Um, it is a CUNY-wide program. We currently have uh, 33 different programs throughout the university. We're on 23 different campuses. Uh, and some campuses have more than one BMI program because they serve different populations. Um, but the whole, the whole uh, program, the goal of the program really is to do what it is exactly that what SPS is doing, but it's really to get more underrepresented populations or, or students that have traditionally been underserved to get them into the university and then ultimately to uh, make sure that they graduate with uh, some measure of success. So, so we do it in a variety of ways. Mentoring is a big part of that. That's the, the, probably the, uh, the biggest way in which we do that. But we also deal with academic enhancements uh, by offering tutoring. We also deal with test prep. Uh, in some cases, there are students who are in our, um, what we call our uh, pre-college programs who are taking uh, uh, studies for things like the HSC exam or the task exam. We're also doing graduate programming for GRE, MCAT. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that we do that the BMI program does. And we've grown over the years to about 4,500 students. So we have uh, a large number throughout the university that we're dealing with and, uh, and we're hoping to grow even higher. And so with, with uh, your help uh, at SBS, and with uh, the help of those around universities, we're going to reach a goal within a few years. It's my goal to get up to 10,000 students. So, uh, so we're actually working hard to do that very thing. I've been working with the city council and the mayor's office and headed to Albany right after this presentation to work with our legislative bodies in the state to, uh, to, to help us further the work that we're doing. I had meetings with the speaker's office, the city council, as well as the chair of higher ed. Councilman Dinowitz, um, and we're, we're, we're launching some really exciting things uh, over the course of the summer. So I, I encourage you to um, look to that. I, 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 I personally am, uh, as, as uh, Sean and Marie and, the, uh, and Dean, uh, the Dean mentioned, have been working in this field for, since 2004, actually. Um, I have uh, been serving the college at, uh, in Queens, York College, which is also my home and my alma mater. Um, I've been serving that college as the director of the York College Mail Initiative Program, which is part of CUNY BMI, as well as the manager of special programs. I was the manager for food insecurity and emergency assistance for students uh, uh, for the last 10 years, where I managed that, that, uh, that assistance to students who were in need, who had, who had troubles or had difficulties, or who had uh, experienced food, food or housing insecurity. And so we were able to um, continue those that type of idea into the, the larger level here at the central office. I'm very, very excited and thankful to be here today. Um, I'm very excited also because your theme happens to be something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, one of the other things that I do in my higher education career is I'm a professor uh, of music. Um, I happen to uh, have a degree in music, but I also teach uh, at your college, and I also teach some college now pro, uh, classes um, about social justice. And so uh, this is really great uh, opportunity for me to kind of talk to you a little bit uh, for a little while about um, how social justice is seen through the eyes of hip hop. Um, I know we think about hip hop um, sometimes as perhaps music only, or we think about it as a culture which is, it's really not, it's not a, you know, we say that very casually, the hip hop culture or the culture of hip hop, but it's really, it's really a movement, you know, culture is something that you kind of were born into, but, but what hip hop is and how, how it came about is really all about a movement. And I want to share a little bit, a little bit of that today. If we, if we think about social justice and the, and I know, and I know we've been defining it all week, I'm sure, but if we think about social justice and its intent, and that is essentially to sort of uh, um, change uh, uh, things in society that we do not particularly agree or care for. So, so because perhaps they are marginalizing certain populations. So what hip hop has done in, in its inception is it followed cer certain movements that took place in the early part of the 20th century. So if you think about um, if you think about um, uh, the civil rights movement. Um, you think about the the uh, uh, black arts movement of the 50s and 60s, 
And if you think about even the post civil rights movement, um, there, there is, a, is, a, is a straight transition into the birth of hip hop, what we call today hip hop, um, uh, in coming all the way from the, the dance halls of Jamaica, West Indies and moving it to the, the United States. We have uh, um, the birth of a, a type of movement that was trying to uh, essentially balance out some of the inequalities economically that occurred in society, such as uh, the type of transformation that was taking place in New York City in the 1970s, as an example, where there were um, large segments of the population that were somewhat isolated from some of the assistance that, that, was, that, was, that was really kind of going out to certain populations, but not others. There are lots of history of New York City, and I, I don't want to get too far into that because that's about a two hour lecture <laughs> alone, but, uh, but, the, but the idea is in, specifically in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, during that time period, there was a, there was a great economic suffrage and inequality. There were, there were several, um, uh, there are several experiences that, that sort of turned that area into a, a, a drought, if you will, of economic advance and success and housing and jobs and, and all the things that kind of went into changing it around. There was even an opportunity or a time, I should say, when, when landlords were burning and torching their own buildings so as to be able to collect the insurance from it and then not putting that back. So then you'd have all these young people in an area where there's nothing but abandoned buildings and, and run down. I remember when I was a kid, I, I grew up in New York and I, I, in Queens my whole life. Uh, I, I would visit my, my relatives who lived, some of which lived in Harlem, some of which lived in the Bronx. And it, and it was strange to me at some time to, to go and see these blocks and blocks of rubble of just bricks and, and, and nothing but and then maybe one building, you know, left, and then you go into another block, and it's the sort of same thing. And then as a young person, you you have to find a way to make that your your playground. You have to find a way to make that your own. So, what what um, what hip hop did, and what the early pioneers of hip hop did, uh, 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 DJ Cool Herc, and you have Africa Bombada, Grandmaster Flash. What they did essentially is took the the music, if you will, of uh, what uh, Kuru Herc was doing as a DJ in, and his parents doing in, in Kingston, Jamaica, brought it to, to, to the United States to try to create a, uh, an opportunity for young people to get together, say, after school or after work, you have these dance parties in the yard, in the backyard, and that kind of a thing. Um, and they began to become, you know, there, there was experimental technology-wise and scratch, and it was developed, and then and then uh, concurrent to that, graffiti became part of the hip hop sort of movement. Um, but the idea is that what they were doing was trying to provide a, a way out, an escape uh, of, of for, for young people to be able to, one, express themselves, but two, be able to find a way to uh, not get caught up in the violence. Because also at this time, 70s and the 80s, there was also a, a, a tremendous amount of drugs that were happening in the community. Uh, that was also destroying, depleting economically uh, the, the community itself and keeping it under suffrage. So what what hip hop was doing in a, in a, in its own way, in its own creative way, was making a social change, uh, and that's really what the um, early pioneers of, of hip hop were trying to do. It's very interesting though too, uh, Africa Bambada uh, and 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 Cool Herc were approached by by a large music company saying, listen, this sound that you guys have here is absolutely amazing. I think it's something that we can kind of, you know, take take it to a larger audience than just New York. Um, you know, let's let's see if we can kind of capture this and move it out into the rest of the country, perhaps even the world. And they say, uh-uh, this is for these young people here. This is a, this is a way for them to be able to, you know, not not get caught up in the streets, to not fight, you know, because they were very clear African Mabada and, and Grandmaster Flash and Cool and Cool Herc to some degree were not exactly like you know church boys. They were they were, <laughs> these guys were on the rough side. So um, they made sure everything in their party stayed safe and they made sure the young people were safe. Um, and so they they uh, they didn't want to change it into something else. And obviously we know over time this did happen where where 
you have uh, the Sugar Hill Gang releasing Rapper's Delight and uh, becoming the first commercially successful hip hop song. You have uh, other elements, you know, during the during the uh, 80s at that time also, in the 70s, there was a, a big disco scene also in New York City. And so you had sort of like a competing uh, uh, areas. You had the wonderful, you know, disco scene in, 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 um, in Manhattan. And then you had like these wonderful hip hop parties that were kind of um, bringing the music alive in New York. And that, that got the world's attention so much. So you have artists like Blondie, uh, who are, who are, uh, actually released uh, songs like Rapture, which had her rapping and, and then the rest of the world was like, what in the world is this? <laughs> so so um, then they became interested and got to see Blondie put in her videos, uh, graffiti and rapping and scratching and, and DJs and breaks and that kind of stuff. And it became a very popular form of entertainment, new. And then the world didn't know what to do with it, how to embrace that. But uh, the idea is though that hip hop then became a, a, an agent of change because in this message, in this in this uh, music, was a message specifically. If you listen way back to Grandmaster Flash and Here's Five, the message, uh, one of their first hit songs that they made, uh, it, it, and they shot it right there in the Bronx in terms of a video. Um, it, it showed, in fact, what was going on, and it showed, in fact, what things that needed to be addressed and changed um, in 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 not just New York, but that that was symptomatic of things that were happening throughout the uh, throughout the city and throughout the cities in America. And so, this music, uh, specifically with an example of like the message um, by Grandmaster Flash, this music became then a voice of young people. It became the the way young people began to express themselves in their own creative way. Hip hop is not just music. Hip hop is also uh, graffiti. It's also break dancing. Um, so the, there were several outlets, and graffiti also a very very big part of it. Um, if you you know were on a subway <laughs> years ago, uh, uh, you couldn't find a clean spot. You know, and anywhere inside the trains were all graffitied up and spray painted. Uh, what we call today tagging versus graffiti, which is two different things, but but for the most part, you know, graffiti artists were kind of like making a statement, showing out this voice, this 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 rebellious nature that young people have found in this movement of hip hop, and so um, it's it's sort of meanders on to today. Um, another kind of um, um, sort of groundbreaking time or, or milestone within the hip hop movement is the is the uh, beating of Rodney King. That is something also on the West Coast that really led to a tremendous push uh, in in um, in hip hop for, for reform. It's something that with we actually still think of today when it comes to reform which police reform, gun violence, drugs, there, those are the kinds of things that sort of were revolving around uh, LA at the time because they were and you know Rodney King was was an incident that that was monumental because it led to so many bad things. But there were um, other other uh, issues that were happening even in L.A. at that time, specifically between two gangs called the Bloods and the Crips, uh, and those uh, those particular segments, those two social organizations, um, you know, became became the sort of dominant forces in the in the. Uh, um, something that my good friend Dr. Ron Daniels calls the dark ghettos. Uh, they became the dominant forces in those spaces. And so uh, hip hop became also at the time a real theme. If you, if you really dig down into West Coast versus East Coast rap and that kind of gangster rap stuff, um, it became it became a, a, a huge movement. Um, and, and by movement, again, I'm, I'm talking about social change, those things that were addressing inequalities. And so um, just moving a little bit further to today, um, the the real the real challenge that we have today with respect to looking at social justice through the through the lens of hip hop, and this is something actually I've been uh, teaching uh, for the last few weeks, and that is there there is a um, an industry uh, that has sort of taken over this this idea of this movement of hip hop and making it a, a commercial success obviously it's huge probably one of the largest music uh, uh, industries in the in the world hip-hop is um you can have artists like kanye west and drake and all, who are known all over the world uh just by their face just by their name just by and they can say 
one thing and, and sell a product, they can put one product name in their song and that product will sell out within a matter of hours. Um, and then on the other side of you still have those artists who are thinking about how to address artists perhaps like Common or others, thinking about how to address some of the inequalities that are, that are occurring in, in, uh, in, in society today. Um, so the, the, the real challenge for us, those of us who live in, in today, 2022, is to think about ways in which we use this artistic form of, of music in terms of hip hop to transform society and lives and inequalities for the better. Um, there, there are, there are, there are schools of thought that think that think that hip hop, just in its original uh, context, the way Africa Bombada and Grandmaster Flash and Cool Herc intended, has changed, and indeed it has. But it has grown into more than just what they had intended. It has grown into something else. However, there are still those moments, and, and I, and like I said, I teach a hip hop class. But there are still those moments where you have a young man or a young woman who's listening to an artist, uh, listening to Kendrick Lamar or listening to whomever uh, or to Jay-Z and they can say, and that those artists have the amazing amount of uh, influence to say one thing about perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps about um, uh, inequality when it comes to economic distribution or, or, or police brutality or gun violence in our community. They can bring attention to these issues in ways in which that those of us who are in education or those who are in government or those who are in whatever, you know, in the house uh, cannot even begin to touch, um, but they can talk about things that really affect uh, individual lives. I mean, people in outside of hip hop, people like Beyonce, people like other artists already try to address those types of issues in their own arena and their own platforms. But sometimes, you know, um, some of the most creative voices are from the uh, the movement of, of uh, hip hop. So I think um, that it is a very significant way today that that we have in order to change. If you if you recall over the over the years back in the fifties and sixties uh, during the creation no, not the creation but the beginning of the civil rights movement, um, there were lots of uh, songs that were done uh, uh, at, at certain times. Um, uh, to to sort of like um, cement those of us in the movement to sort of encourage and lift up uh, songs like Anger Let Nobody Turn Me Around and a bunch of others who that really were performed and sung during those mo movements, those moments in the movement, the anti-war movement in the, in the 60s, Bob Dylan wrote a song, The Answer My Friend Is Blowing In The Wind, uh, that was part of one of the anthems of uh, the anti-war movement at the time. And then Sam Cooke immediately came out right after that with a change is going to come also became an anthem during the civil rights movement. Rolling back the hands of time looking at the uh, early settlers early slaves here in America, uh, there were spirituals there were freedom songs that were sung on the plantation um, and and throughout history in America music has been part of social reform and part of the changes. That have been taking place in society and hip hop is no different it's somewhat of an evolution of that uh, in the sense that it takes the the current uh, uh challenge by a particular people by those who are oppressed um it takes the the the, the voice of the oppressed and it allows the world to hear what in fact is going on you know what the issues are what the ills are what the problems are what the challenges are and that 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 is the power of music, and um, and it really really is incredible. And I and I encourage us on this call, and for those who are not on the call, for, who will listen to this some other time, uh, I encourage us to think about uh, perhaps one or two songs that really from this this movement of hip hop that really um, uh, do some of the things that we want to see happen in society. We all we we want change. We look at the, we look outside or even in the news every day, and we see um, every day things happening that are uh, we, it's causing us to scratch our heads and say, what in the world is going on? What is happening in the Bronx, in, in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in Queens? What is going on with young people? What is going on with homelessness? What is going on with mental, mental illness? And what, is go and what are we doing about it? You know, what, what, what in the heck is happening here? 
Um, and I had, as I mentioned at the very beginning, had a conversation with uh, a councilman, uh, Dinowitz, uh, who is the chair of higher education for New York City Council. He said to me, you know, I, you know, I can't, you know, the Bronx is his borough. And he says, I, I don't I have no answers for what's happening. Um, but it seems as if these images of black and brown men are being completely dominated by the violence that's going on and completely dominated by some of the things in society that are happening and they're putting a face on it of black and brown men. However, there are for every one of those individuals that we see um, something bad about on the news, there's another nine or 10 uh, that are doing some amazing things, some of which are right here in this in this mail initiative program at, at, at uh, SPS, some of which are throughout the city. And those are the ones that we really need to celebrate and highlight. Those are the ones we really need to show the world that no, 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 not every, not every person is out here shooting up in malls in Roosevelt Field or in American Dream. You know, you have one person in that mall who brings a gun and then 1400 other people get, you know, <laughs> sort of get whitewashed into this, into this idea that all black or brown men are bad. No, no, uh, uh, there's, there's heroes in our, in our everyday lives. Um, and there are people in our everyday lives who are who are making a difference and change, trying to change the narrative. And changing the narrative is what I believe, anyway, hip hop has been doing and, is, and will continue to do. Yes, there are those marginal artists who are not necessarily about the movement. They're about the culture, if you will. Um, but, but there are still some in, in musicians and artists who are doing what they do because they love what they do and they know that what they are doing will affect someone one day and affect someone with respect to their uh, intent in life, it perhaps help educate them, perhaps get them to a to a, a place in life that they want to be. I will, I, will, I will tell you this one story I had about uh, Grandmaster Flash. Uh, I invited him to come out to York College a few years ago when I was a, first became director at York College and he came out and he spoke. Um, and talked about he talked about a lot of things about what he's doing now about his nutrition program and all that, but also talked about early days of hip hop. And um, when I, I I was bringing young men from Roosevelt, Long Island, from Westbury, from um, Hempstead and Unidale, those high schools, I was bringing them to York for a summit, somewhat of a hip hop summit at the time, and. Um, and so, and so he, he gave this great presentation, he along with a few other hip hop artists. And, um, but I just remember Grandmaster Flash's effect. There was one young man I, I talked to afterwards. He was uh, maybe, maybe 16, 15, 16 years old. Uh, he, he, had, he had come from Hempstead High School and uh, he came and I asked him what he thought about the, uh, the session, what he thought about the event. He says, you know, I never, um, uh, I, until coming here today, I never really had an idea of what I wanted to do in life, but listening to Grandmaster Flash and listening to some of the things that he talked about as to what uh, uh, hip hop did for him in terms of his life. I now know that I need to be serious about what it is that I want to do. I can't just go through life uh, not knowing what I want to do, but I need to know, I need to be able to choose a career and I'm going to focus on that uh, and the seriousness of it. And I should just say, as I mentioned, Grandmaster Flash talked about having a having a, a career path and a, and, a, and a means of making money um he had this new program he was pushing but also in a means of making money outside of your art or your talent or your gift but also uh, creating wealth within the, your community and so this young man was very inspired by that uh and really inspired to do something um to make a difference and so um and it was very it was very touching because he was very moved he he's a little a little kid who didn't have any you know any any uh, it's it, it sort of uh, distinguishing characteristics other than just being present, you know, on the bus to come over here to come up to York. Um, but leaving there is is uh, he was changed. And so I think that that's something that we ought to remember about what social justice is about. And that is to ultimately make a change uh, to ultimately make a change in the environment in our society, but also to change the minds of the next generation that is to come because that's how real change happens. Um, that is, you know, the Gen Zers and the next generations and all, but those are the change makers. Those are the ones who are gonna go out and do the things 
that we want to see happen. It's not going to happen by old people like me and Michael, <laughs> but uh, it's going to happen by uh, by those who who are the next generation who are going to say, uh, listen, you know, I, I understand what you guys were doing and you know what your situation is regarding this legislation or this whatever, but that's not what we're about. We want we want this. We want to be able to see something happen with this side. So. Um, I encourage all of you today to please go out and be those agents of change. Think about hip hop and think about the positive effect it has had on many a generation of many young people uh, and continues to do so. So I, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to be here today. And uh, it, it indeed has been a pleasure for me to share my, um, my little bit of knowledge <laughs> regarding hip hop and social justice based upon my work. Thank you so much. Dr. Cross, thank you for your, 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 your time, your energy, and, and enthusiasm today regarding hip hop. Um, uh, I myself, um, this is not a, uh, you know, to use the phrase, a fanboy reaction to, you know, your conversation today, but uh, as someone who grew up with Webster Martin Center Projects in the Bronx, um, uh, someone whose uh, uh, uncles uh, had uh, uh, worked with uh, some of those uh, individuals as far as doing security for them. Is concerned as a little kid that walked around being nosy and you know wondering what it was, you know my my aunts and you know well, how come they were going to jams? If you remember that phrase, Dr. Cross, how come they were going to jams in the park? And I had no business being there. Clearly, um, it was uh, <laughs> it was very enlightening to to hear what you had to say. And from a from a social justice standpoint, you know, I, um, you know whether it's the songs such as. But I posted or having a, a more of a firm understanding of how I, our young people become immersed in social movements uh, being driven, you know, by certain songs uh, that they may hear on the radio and so forth. Do, do you think that hip hop bears a, a certain responsibility um, in, in terms of uh, movements and our reaction to it or, or our reaction to current events of the day? I do not happen to think it bears a certain responsibility in uh, any more than the Fist Jubilee singers bore responsibility for transforming the image of slaves in the country at, at that time. Um, I think that uh, um, sometimes we, we do like to scapegoat and put things on uh, um, artists and, and movements and that kind of thing because of the impact that they have. Um, it's sort of like the same thing about um, with uh, sports uh, at, and athletes and, the, you know, potential leadership. I could care less about what an athlete thinks or what they, you know, what their political views are, you know, because they're all, all, I don't, all I want to see to do is play ball. Um, and so I'm not going to put anything more on hip hop than uh, in terms of a movement as far as bearing responsibility. However, I do feel that there are artists who need to be responsible. Um, so I think that there are there is a, there are two things there that I think uh, um, I do think there is a, there are some level and some some historians sort of suggest that there's some level of uh, um, sellout when it comes to um, artists and 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 uh, what they do why they do because they don't necessarily live the life that they're rapping about or, or creating music about um, so there's this dichotomy there um, but in terms of uh, um, responsibility. I don't think a movement has responsibility. I think the move, movers <laughs> are the ones who are responsible. And I, and I do think, you know, we, we need to understand those who are who are the movers and those who are not. You can't, you know, you, you, you can tell me, for instance, that uh, I, I, I would say that Chuck D has more responsibility than Kanye West. <laughs> because one's a mover and one's not only because, uh, you know, well, I only say that because um, they're, they're, you know, you have to, in some cases, understand the intent. And some, and if your intent is to be a mover and a shaker, if you will, then then yes, then you 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 bear your responsibility. It's like going to church. You expect your pastor to, to preach about the word or something, you know. Um, but if you know you're going to to someone else whose intent is not the same, then you should not have that expectation uh, of that particular. Uh, artists or, or individuals. So I, I think that there's a, you have to be very careful with that. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions? Any questions, uh, Sonia Marie? 
Yeah, um, you know, I've always heard, I mean, I've heard it a lot of times, people ask the question, what should be done to improve the success of black males or black male students? How would you answer them using the BMI um, program? And how would you use this program, program sorry, to motivate black students, especially black male students? Great, that's a great question. Uh, and actually we have been doing that. The, the, I will just sort of give you some facts for some data. Uh, the, the, the BMI program actually um, has a higher percentage of retention and, and, and uh, persistence than non-BMI students. The BMI students have a higher GPA than non-BMI students. The BMI students have a higher graduation rate than non-BMI students. So that means that we're doing it and how we do it is the, the model of student engagement. There's a theorist uh, named Alexander Aston who believes that the more you engage a student, the, the more level of success that they will have. So what we do is we engage them at a, at a higher level than just a, a person who's not in a program like BMI. By engagement, we simply mean being involved with the, the learning process or education outside of the classroom. Of course, they're engaged in the classroom and that's most of the time that they spend in school. But there's a, a, a real risk sometimes for students who are not necessarily engaged out of the classroom to not be successful because they're only coming to class but to get a grade or to pass a test or something. And they're not looking at the totality of what education can do for them, how it can build them up in other areas, but also how it can help them with respect to even their coursework. So, um, we do try our best to make sure that students are connected to a mentor. Uh, we do try our best to make sure that students are connected to um, uh, some type of support programming that helps them academically. We have out of the 4,500 students that we have, 2,900 of those are mentors. Um, and so we have a, a really high number of mentors, the largest mentoring program in New York City uh, outside of the My Brother's Keeper program, which is secondary education. Um, but it is it is a uh, is a model in higher ed that is that is you know one that is being duplicated around the country because of the, of the success that we have now the challenge is your question really kind of speaks to what do we do about those students who are not in BMI because those are the ones who we need to uh, we need to co connect with and then I say what we do Sean and Marie is get Sean and Marie to get out there and get them <laughs> the, the the idea is it, it takes the village. You know to to raise a child and so we're trying to um to make sure we connect with as many people as we can who serve as ambassadors and say listen you need to get connected i used to have faculty members bringing students into my office after the class saying these two men or these two two or three young men need to be in your program um so that those are the kinds of things that we need to do we need to engage with faculty we need to engage with community we, i used to engage with churches i call all the churches in jamaica queens together and uh, had all the pastors come and they said, listen, we need to get your students. So what we did was create a mentoring program in their church uh, and be able to reach, reach out to students, uh, students, whatever vehicle we had. And then ultimately we were able to get a mentoring program together with churches uh, and grouping up. Um, and it, and it, uh, it, you know, the idea is we, it, takes a, it takes a lot you know, to reach everyone, but we're trying our best, but we just need more support in terms of uh, people to help us out, more arms to reach and, uh, and do, do the best we can. Thank you for that. And I'll definitely be stirring my son in that direction. <laughs> nice, awesome, awesome. Any other questions from the audience? Any other questions? I come and pitch in now. Oh, I was we were taking questions. I was, did you have a specific question? Um, actually, yeah, I have a specific question for everyone else. Should I? Is it okay if I ask? Sure. So, with the way our speaker was uh, speaking about hip hop, I, I was gonna ask the question to everyone: Do you think hip hop is going the right direction? As in, the way they're influencing us, is that correct? Thank you. 
So the, the question from Iris was, I guess, uh, so listening to your impressions of uh, hip hop's impact on a society level, whether or not you think based on what you know, uh, you know whether or not it has a, a positive or even a, a negative impact. And, and maybe you want to go into why you may feel that way. So you can feel free to post in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, we definitely would like to hear what you may have to say. Taking a point to drill music. <laughs> drill music is a whole nother world. <laughs> whole other world. <laughs> that's, that's no boundaries in that. Um, I, well, while people ask uh, answer Iris's question, uh, I'll, I'll handle Karen Thompson's question. <clears throat> I think drill music is is an artistic form of music um, that it that becomes. Um, I personally am not a big fan, but it becomes a, there are a lot of students who I, a lot of my, my students who really love it. Um, it becomes something that is it is. Uh, uh, I think worth analyzing when it comes to the intent, but it's artistic because there's there's also in other forms of music, there are also set types of drill music in those. I mean, in blues, you know, you have, you know, you have you know, cotton blues, you have Delta blues, you have Mississippi blues, you have gutter, you, know, you have very, very, you know, raunchy blues, you know. Um, uh, I, and so even from years ago, I remember hearing some artists sing, um, and there's some famous jazz artists too, who, who sing what we would consider <laughs> to be like drill music and jazz. Um, so I think it's nothing that, you know, it's, it's, it's just artistic and it's not, it's not necessarily something even back to Michael's question before, it's not something to place on the shoulders of hip hop, uh, but it is something that is uh, it's just an artistic thing, just like just like just like positive uh, hip hop or just like um, uh, reggaeton or or you know something else. It's, it's just a it's a it's just, it's just an artistic style. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, any anyone else? Anyone? Anyone would like to expand on um, the question I was asked about your impression of hip hop and its impact? Um, apart impact? from hip hop, apart sorry, apart oh. from hip hop, what other music do you use? You know to make you know to do what you do with hip hop then? Uh, in terms of as a movement. And social justice. Well, I think uh, oh, historically, uh, gospel and the spirituals uh, have been part of uh, social movements. Uh, um, certain types of pop music, uh, like folk music, has been, uh, as I mentioned before, Bob Dylan uh, was a big part of the anti war movement with uh, certain songs like uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. And there's, there's, a, there's quite a few different styles. Uh, a Bob Marley, also a great example of um, of uh, movement music. Um, so, it, so there's different styles, uh, uh, and I think it all depends upon the where the person's coming from, like their own history, what they know. Uh, you can look at "Man in the Mirror" by Michael Jackson, uh, and also find um, uh, movement music in that. Um, but then you you know, but if you don't know Michael Jackson, you know, then it's not really gonna mean, you know, no one's gonna really think about it. But uh, um, so I think it, it it depends upon the background of the person, but there's I think almost in every culture, there's music that speaks to um, uh, not revolution necessarily, but but social change um, that that really talks about um, you know how things can be better. Um, I think it all it all depends upon the uh, the background of the person, but but you can find it every in every style of I mean, country music and, and blues. You can find it in, in you know. Sam Cooke said it best, and change is going to come in pop music, so it's everywhere. Dr. Quash, uh, Diana posted, uh, asked the question, is BMI only centered around music? So, no. <laughs> Thank you, Diane Haynes. I appreciate that. BMI is actually not at all centered around music. I am centered around music because I'm also a professor of music. But um, uh, BMI is centered around uh, mentoring academic and uh, achievement and uh, essentially um, uh, enrollment, graduation, uh, uh, what happens in between. Uh, so, so it doesn't focus on music at all. In fact, none of the, none of the, none of the uh, campus projects deal with music. Uh, it's just I deal with music because I have two 
roles in the university, and, and one of which is a professor of music, and I teach hip hop history and social justice courses. Are all the mentor students? Some, in some cases, uh, out of those uh, mentors that I mentioned, the two thousand nine hundred, those are all students. Um, there are some who are alumni. Uh, like at the John Jay's Pipeline for Justice program, they have alumni who mentor some of those students because those alumni have gone through law school and they've already know what the process is like. So they mentor the ones in the pipeline to get to law school. So, so there are some who are uh, the mentors in some cases who are, who are alumni and some who are um, part of a pre-college program, like in the Fatherhood Academy, there are some mentors in that. Those students are not yet in the university system, they're, they're young fathers who are looking to take the HSC exam. Um, the, the, so they're not in the system as far as uh, a, CUNY, a CUNY student, but they are pre-college. So they're in, they're, uh, their mentors is, is in those programs as well. But so they're not all students, but it's depending upon the, the, the campus and the chapter. Great. Sean-Marie? Yes, um, last question or questions. Um, what first piqued your interest and what encouraged you to get involved in this program? What has motivated you to continue in the program and where do you see the program in the future moving forward? Well, I, I come from a background prior to joining uh, the BMI family in 2004. I come from a background of, of somewhat activism and social change. I heavily involved with community organizations in Jamaica, Queens. Um, and 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 so this was a, I was appointed by the president of the college, uh, Dr. Marcia Keys, and um, because of my work in the community. So this sort of was an extension of what I was doing with young people in the community at the time. Uh, and as far as um, where I see it going, <coughs> excuse me. I think uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, my goal is to 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 move to ten thousand, and then and then move on from there in terms of keep keep growing. Uh, we have over 240,000 students in the university. Um, and I, we only have 4,500 in the uh, BMI program. So there's certainly more than, than that that we can reach. And so the goal is to reach the unreached. And so that's what I'm trying to do to make sure that we reach out and get to as many young men as we can. There's still, we still have problems with students dropping out. Um, they still have problems, a huge problem with enrollment right now. And um, and it's not necessarily the fault of the student, you know, but it's or potential student. But it, it's it's there are things that we need to do better uh, by reaching those students who are falling between the cracks, um, not connecting to someone. There's 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 some, some students who don't need to connect to anyone. They they have a support system. They know what they want to do. They're, they they can graduate, they don't have any issues, and they could care less about anything but getting that grade and going home. <laughs> and, and that's totally fine. But there's other students who have a situation like we were, we were reeled over the pandemic where they don't want to be at home. Uh, they don't want to be around people who are toxic. They don't want to be around circumstances in which they can't study. Uh, they don't want to be around situations in which that create a violent uh, uh, environment for them. Um, so, so, now those are the students who were losing and those are the ones who are forcing to you know not stay with us so those are the ones we have to try to reach so that that's my my goal over the next few years uh will be to really get that done to to reach i mean obviously i can't hit every student but um i'd like to reach as many as we can and try to try to um, change those those numbers Got the question. I have one more question. Um, can you speak to other programs that are, uh, you know, within, you know, within our system that has, you know, BMI roots that some of us may not know about? I know you touched on, you know, uh, the pipeline and the father initiative. Oh. What are other programs that some may not know about? Well, they sure. Well, they, there are a lot, and I see Marcia Cantarella, the the amazing Marcia Cantarella, is also here and, and commenting in the chat. Uh, but there are a lot of programs. I, I really would. I'm not going to call out every one because uh, there's there's 33. <laughs> so, uh, but I do encourage you if you go to our website, uh, the BMI website, you will find just just Google B, CUNY BMI. You will find all of them listed. And as I mentioned, there there's some in every borough. Uh, there's some campuses have more than one. 
uh, and they speak to different populations. So if you if you go to um, the CUNY BMI website, it says campus projects, and they're all listed there. Not only are they listed, <clears throat> but they're also the um, the contact information of the directors are there. Um, like like Anthony Sweeney is listed there, like Michael Gill is listed there. So all of those all for, for SPS, but all of the programs are listed there. So please feel free to visit our website, or even if you want to connect with us somehow, um, uh, if you're perhaps not part of SPS, um, but there's an interest form on the website as well. You can also fill out a uh, form, and we can you can connect you with a, a, a program at a campus. Um, as well, but it is something that we would love for to keep growing, you know, to continue to do more and more. Um, but yeah, there, there are, there's projects at pretty much every every campus, it's every throughout CUNY, which and there are a lot. Um, but there are projects at every campus, so so uh, just look at the uh, website. And the question Diana just asked, um, as a woman, what role can she play in the <laughs> Well, women are a strong part of the program. I could tell you that at your college, if I didn't have women, that I wouldn't have a program because a lot of times uh, women are the ones who really uh, support the program the most. Um, I have I had at the at the time, and I still manage that program. But there there are f female mentors, female tutors. Uh, students who want to be part of the mentoring program. I have women who come to me after they sit through what I call a barbershop. It's like a group mentoring session. They sit through that and they say, listen, I want to be part of this program. This is fantastic. This, this, this is great information. It's great sharing and it's a great uh, a cohort. <clears throat> so those are those are um, some of the things that um, uh, women can be take take part in every aspect of the uh, program. Uh, um, you know, there, there's very, very few exceptions. The only exceptions I know, like my program at York had a uh, fraternity called Pi Eta Kappa, so that's a little different, um, uh, and perhaps Fatherhood Academy. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, I think uh, women can, you know, have a place in every single aspect of the of the BMI program. So it's not open to only men; it's open to women as well. Thank you for that, Dr. Cross, and to, to Diana. If I may go out on a limb, um, what about would greatest examples to your question is, is actually on this call and that's Sean Marie mm -hmm. Reyes Cox. Um, yeah. uh, she along with, uh, we have a couple of female mentors who are working with us this semester. Um, uh, like Dr. Kwan said, um, they, 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 they show up and they show out. <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, her participation today um, is an example of that. So please feel free to reach out to myself, Sean Marie, uh, Anthony, and um, you know, if you want to get involved, let's talk about it, please. So on that note, recognizing what time it is, I'm going to ask um, Aris to take us to the bridge to use the bridge. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for appearing for the uh, meeting. I thank you, Dr. Quash, as well, for speaking these kind words. And uh, if there's any final questions before I close it, I guess this is the time now. Otherwise, I bid everyone farewell. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Be safe. Be social. Have a good day, everyone. Be empowered. It was great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Quash. Thank you. Same travels, Dr. Quash. <laughs>